Okay, so in this video, I'm going to look at some IGCSC questions on waves and optics. So let's start off looking at sound. And we need to match up the speed of sound in gas and the speed of sound in a solid with its corresponding speed. So the speed of sound in air is 330, so we, we can match uh, the speed of sound in gas up. And the speed of sound in solid is quite a bit faster. Um, in, a, in a lot of solids, it's usually quoted as being like 4,000, 5,000, something like that. Uh, so I'm going to go with the 3,000 answer here. And then liquid is somewhere in between those two values, usually quoted as high hundreds or low thousands. So explain why sound waves are described as longitudinal. Well, the sound waves cause particles of the medium to oscillate parallel to the direction of energy transfer. So it creates regions of compressions and rarefactions when it does that. So the diagram shows the, how the displacement of air molecules at any instant of time varies with distance along the path of a sound wave. Okay, so sketch two cycles of a sound wave that has a shorter wavelength and a greater amplitude. Okay, so greater amplitude, uh, we can see the peak is further from the central line and shorter wavelength, so we've completed two full cycles in a shorter distance than the original wave did. State two changes in the sound heard compared to the original. Well, bigger amplitude means it's louder uh, and a shorter wavelength means it's higher frequency, so it's higher pitch. Frequency of monochromatic light is produced by a laser at 4.7 times 10 to the 14 hertz. A ray of light from the laser passes from a vacuum where the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. State what is meant by monochromatic? Well, it means light of only one wavelength, or we could also say one frequency. They're the same thing. So what is the frequency of light in the fiber optic cable? Well, it's going to be 4.7 times 10 to the 14. Uh, no processes that actually change the frequency. So reflection, refraction, diffraction, none of those processes change wave frequency. Uh, they can only change speed or wavelength, or at least some of them do. So the speed of light in the optical fiber is 2 times 10 to the 8. Calculate the refractive index. Well, refractive index is the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the speed of light in the material. I haven't put the times 10 to the 8 in because it's the same on top and bottom line, so there's no point. So you get a refractive index of 1.5. Calculate the wavelength of the cable. Well, we know the speed and we know the frequency, so we can use the wave equation, V equals lambda f, to calculate the wavelength. And I'm going to give it to two significant figures because both of our sets of data are two significant figures. Describe one example of how optical fibers are used in medicine. So they're used in a device called an endoscope, which you use to uh, examine the digestive tract. Uh, so you either stick them down somebody's throat to look in their stomach, or you stick them somewhere more unpleasant to have a look at their like intestines and stuff. And they work by light being totally internally reflected along the length of the endoscope to travel from inside the patient to the person looking at it. That's, the, that's why they're involved in op the optics topic. Okay, so we've got a wave front passing from the open sea into an outer harbour. So we've got, initially we've got a gap that's much bigger than the wavelength. So we can see the central part of the wave is not diffracted, it's only the edges that get diffracted by the harbour edges. It says the wave fronts are, so it says name the process that's occurring, well it's diffraction, the spreading out of waves when they encounter a gap or an edge. And it says show the rest of the wave pattern. Uh, so we've got one more wave front before it hits the uh, next wall and then the next gap is the similar size as the wavelength so we're going to get maximum diffraction we're going to get these semicircular wave fronts coming out so the diagram shows an aerial view of wave fronts in deep water approaching a region of shallow water where they travel more slowly okay Name the process that occurs when you go from deep to shallow water. Uh, well, you're going to get refraction because you get a change in speed. Uh, so show possible positions of the five wave fronts in the shallow water. So first of all, I'm going to draw some rays on here. 
So rays are perpendicular to the wavefronts. And I've also drawn in a normal to the interface. Because if it's going to slow down in shallow water, it's going to bend towards the normal. So we can see where the rays would go. And then all we have to do is draw lines perpendicular to the rays that are attached to the end of the existing wavefront. So we get something that looks a little bit like this. So a ray of light from a laser passes from air into a glass block. Okay. The ray continues in the same direction and meets the middle of the opposite surface at an angle of 40 degrees to the normal. The refractive index of the plastic is 1.5. Okay, so the ray continues into the air. Calculate the angle between the normal and the path taken by the light after it leaves the block. So I'm going to use Snell's law for this. Uh, this gets quoted in lots of different forms in different textbooks, but this is the general form that I'll use. And then it's going into air, so N2 is 1. So we can see that sine R is N1 sine I, and we can calculate what that is. And then once we've got sine r, we use the inverse sine function to calculate what the angle of refraction is. The frequency of the light produced by a laser is 3.8 times 10 to the 14 hertz. And the wavelength in the plastic block is 5.3 times 10 to the minus 7. Calculate the speed of light in this plastic. So uh, we're going to use the wave equation again because we've got frequency and wavelength. Uh, and then we can calculate the speed from that. So we can see that it's 2 times 10 to the 8. If we want the speed of light in air, we know the refractive index, so we can actually calculate what the speed is. And it's going to be 3 times 10 to the 8, because it travels about the same speed in air as it does in a vacuum. Uh, so that kind of works. Explain why the ray does not change direction when it enters the plastic block. Well, if you look at it, you can see it hits the boundary along the normal. So if the ray is traveling on the normal, the angle of instance is zero. So since the angles, the uh, not angles, the refractive indexes can't be zero, that must mean the angle of refraction is zero. Uh, so essentially it just continues in a straight line along the normal. So the diagram shows rays of violet and red light incident on a prism. The dashed line shows the path taken by violet. Draw red light uh, the path red light would take. So I'm going to draw in a normal to start with because red light travels at a higher speed so it has a smaller refractive index than violet which means it has a bigger angle of refraction which you can see shown to the normal. Another way of describing it is we often say that red light is refracted less than violet light is. This is another way of saying the same thing. The diagram shows the principal axis of a converging lens and the center line of the lens. Okay, so we've got an object two centimeters high placed two centimeters to the left of the lens and the converging lens has a focal length of three centimeters. Okay, so we want to draw a scale diagram to find the distance of the image from the lens and the height of the image and then we're going to identify whether it's real or virtual. Okay, so first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the two focal lengths. So that's the two three centimeter focal lengths. The object is two centimeters from the lens and is two centimeters high. So we can put that in. Now we draw two rays, one going straight through the center, which means it doesn't get refracted. And then one coming in perpendicular to the principal axis. And then that will go through the uh, principal focus. So we can see that those two rays are diverging, so what we need to do is extrapolate them back to find out their virtual convergence point, and then we can put in our image, and the, this would be the distance of the image. So we can now measure the height and the distance, so both of these I get to come out as 6.3 centimeters. So that's what we can fit in there. So it says state and explain whether the image is real or virtual. It's a virtual image because no light rays actually go from the object to the image. And what that means is we cannot display it on a screen. Uh, so there is actually no image or light rays going through where the image is. It's just a trick of our brain, which is how a magnifying glass essentially works by tricking our brain. <laughs> 